So uh, Brian and Ann are here. We're going to get started shortly. Uh, get started shortly. We will have a book signing, and it'll be over here in this area afterwards. Uh, I'm encouraging you to consider uh, your book purchase now, but I've got a couple books to give away, but I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. So we talked a little bit about sprouts already, right? The sprouts are a big part of our food program at Hippocrates. And uh, everything that's not a sprout, Brian calls recreational food. So we suggest that you do about 75% of your food choices are sprouts, OK? Lots and lots of sprouts every which way. You can slice them, dice them, turn them, or twist them, or eat them. In this book is a lot of information, very good detailed information about sprouts. And it's also called Life Force. So it's one of probably the most popular books, I would say. They've written a lot of books. Some of the newer books are Belief About Relationships. Also, Anna has just written Power of a Woman. Brian's just written Dairy Deception. What I have is Life Force and Longevity. Very, very popular. But somebody's going to live, somebody's going to win Life Force. And Dr. Brian will sign it tonight for you. And that's going to be Nilsa Fontan is. All right, come on up, Nilsa. Everybody loves to win, don't they? Yes. Enjoy that. She's got life force, doesn't she? Look at that smile. That is life force. One of the other really popular books, and this is probably a bestseller, uh, aside from Anna's Healthful Cuisine. This has actually got recipes. Did you ever wonder why would a person like Alex decide that he wants to figure out how to pull the funds together to pull off another 97 restaurants, right? He's not crazy. Look, he's happy, too. Look at that. <laughs> and he's not even, did you say you're not even a restaurant guy? OK, well, whatever. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. <laughs> I feel you. So living foods for optimum health, for me, I needed a change. And it had to be a drastic overhaul. I can assure you, I really needed it. Inside this book, it gives you the mental mindset to make it happen. OK, are you, are you hearing me? The mental concept, like Alex. The reasons behind the reasons. Not only that, but it also has lots of great recipes. So if you want to figure out how to make this fancy walnut wrapped taco at home, maybe not exactly the same, but in a special way, you can do that with this book right here. And that winner is Is there a Rachel in the house? Where's Rachel? Come on up, Rachel. Are you Rachel? How do I know you're Rachel? Okay. What's your last name? OK, she's a winner. Rachel's a winner. All right. Enjoy getting that book signed tonight, OK? All right. So we're going to go ahead and get started now. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Jackie Compizzi and her husband, Greg. Come on over. We're going to start tonight. Yep, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Jackie and Greg. Um, they've absolutely ama oh, amazed and they're just incredible beings on this planet. So I'll let them tell their story briefly, and then we're going to introduce Anna Maria, and then Brian Clement for the evening. All right, so Jackie and Greg. Fantastic, thank you. If I knew I was going to be on TV, I'd have put some pants on. Um, I thought I wanted to tell you how important tonight might be for you by telling you how important it was for me. Dr. Brian Clement and Dr. Anna, Anna Marie Clement and the Hippocrates Institute have <laughs> given me my wife back and have given my children their mother back. And I was sitting here where you are about a year ago, listening to one of their presentations. And about a w month later, Jackie was diagnosed with stage four metastatic incurable cancer. And here we are eight months, almost a year later, and her cancer markers are down 80%. And her hormones are almost balanced. And she's 15 years younger. And she's 56 pounds lighter. So uh, the efforts of these people, the lifelong efforts of these people, the tireless efforts of these people have given us that. So we're tremendously grateful, uh, of course. Um, but I wanted to impress upon you that it might be that important to you as you listen tonight. Uh, enjoy them. Greg may not have mentioned, I did that without chemotherapy, radiation, or drugs. I did have anesthesia for my eight-hour surgery, but because of this lifestyle, I did not need post-medication after the surgery, and I was released in four days with just an ice pack 
that's tremendous. As a doctor myself, I never heard of that. I didn't think it was possible. Uh, so I, you can imagine how inspired I was. So uh, C. Brian tonight and myself, um, we just came from three days of a doctor immersion where these two doctors here, that um, Dr. Clements, they are so generous to allow doctors to come from all over the world to learn about Hippocrates because this is the future of medicine and the doctors are calling it, you know, the, the hospital of the future. We now have 100 doctors that are interested in this method and want to spread it amongst you. So how awesome is that? Yale doctors, doctors from all over the planet. Um, if you're inspired to go to Hippocrates, I suggest that you speak with C. Brian or myself afterwards. There's a life transformation program. There's a certificate here that we can help you save significant discount on tuition. And um, we would be interested in helping you ask, uh, answer questions about the program. So again, I'm going to turn this over to the people you came to see, the people that changed our lives, Dr. Anna Maria Clement and Dr. Clement. Well, so I stand here, <laughs> and it is wonderful. You know, it is really time that people get to hear the truth. And, you know, we've, we've kind of been sold a bill of goods in so many ways, in our supermarkets, in our dental office, in our hospitals, and, you know, and even people that we, we thought that we could trust about health, that nutritionists, dietitians. And so, you know, there's, there's time to go beyond what they have learned because there's been corporations that have taught them what they needed to know so that it could be in their favor. So it is a whole other story when you start to be responsible yourself. And then it's a wondrous world. <laughs> it is a jungle because you start looking into, who can I trust then? Who, who has some experience? Well, the institute has 60 years behind, and Wigmore, who founded this institute, healed herself of stage four colon cancer, totally naturally, and then helped thousands and thousands, and now beyond millions and millions all over the world. She came from Lithuania. She was very sickly when she came, and she lived up in Massachusetts, and she got sicker and sicker, and by the time she was 50, she got stage four colon cancer. Well, in Lithuania, this now is such a big movement, and people are so proud that she came from Lithuania that a few years ago, we put a big memorial up in her own hometown that was ridden by wars, of course, and, uh, but the church is still there, and there's a beautiful park there where the memorial is, and, uh, you know, it's just celebration. Now, when we, every time we come to Lithuania, Vilnius is the capital. It fills up the whole conference hall. Everybody comes, and all the media comes, and people are really interested, from professors, doctors, you name it. So this is what we wish for in this country. This is what we wish for, that we would be so humble that we would understand that you know, we need to go back to nature, and we need to take care of nature. We need to take care of the soil. We need to take care of our animals. And do we need to eat animals to feed ourselves? No. Nobody ever needed to eat an animal to feed themselves. So then, then the jungle is like, okay, how many avocados do I have to eat to make up for that steak? <laughs> Is that the quality or the quantity? Now you're looking to quality. So now if you see us eat, and we eat a big plate of sprouts, of sunflower sprouts, pea sprouts, broccoli sprouts, uh, mung bean sprouts, you name it, have more protein than that steak ever could give you. We had a discussion with our son the other day, because he's brought up vegan all his life. But you know, friends of his are wondering, you can't get protein out of steak. I mean, why, why is it just that you understand that protein is so easy to absorb from vegan and live food, um, vegetables, sprouts? And uh, we explained to him, it is nearly impossible to take the protein out of meat. And so he was thinking about it a long time. And, you know, he, he's, uh, he's really getting into the science of uh, vegan food, of live food. And, 
you know, it's, it's so nice to see how he's growing into it mentally because he's been brought up with it all his life. But now he's starting to understand. The, the, and it makes him humble, you know. He, he even says when we go to the Institute, this is a amazing place. I mean, this is a really cool place. That's his words. <laughs> because now he's starting to see what happens. People come in, you know, the first couple of days, you have headaches, nausea, you're grouchy, you know, your adrenals are already stressed because you come away from home, and it took a lot for you to pack up for three weeks. And then by the third week, I mean, you are just smiling. You, you feel like you're in a different place, and you love the foods that's been given to you the first week. It doesn't taste so good. It's pretty bland. And by the third week, you think our chef has new recipes. Like, why didn't they serve this food the first week? Because I would have liked that. <laughs> but you know, their taste buds changed. So you know, it's, it, it's an amazing time now to get into taking care of yourself, because nobody can do that better than you. So enjoy Brian's um, conference here for you. And he will have questions and answers. So write down all your questions, because at the end, he will answer you. Thank you. How are you doing, Miami? Come on, Miami. This is a local audience here. It's so nice to get in the car and drive two hours south rather than in a plane 10 hours somewhere. So tonight, we think we're going to explore a little bit about the basics on living food. But this history, which Anna Maria gave you part of, I want to elaborate on. When I began to think about changing my lifestyle as a young man, it was out of desperation. I really couldn't walk anymore without waddling. I couldn't breathe very well, and I was just a boy. I was in my late teens and early 20s. And somehow, I believe there was intervention, and I met this very weird guy that was a vegetarian. I didn't know what a vegetarian was. I grew up in New York. And I can tell you something, I absolutely was trained well to think if you didn't consume animal foods, you were going to die. What was really remarkable for me, this, this guy that was about a decade older than me, was the healthiest individual I ever saw. He did something else I didn't know about besides being a vegetarian. He did yoga. Nobody did yoga then. Matter of fact, it was almost outlawed by churches and synagogues. <laughs> He twisted his body. He was the first guy I ever saw with muscles. I didn't know what they looked like. And when he wasn't around and my buddies weren't around, I said to my girlfriend, let's try some of that stuff. And before you know it, the pounds started to drop off. But most important, I started to think differently. I stopped thinking out of fear and thinking out of a narrow perspective and my heart opened up a bit. And I started to realize that life may be quite different than I was taught, even under the conditions of a loving family. I didn't have a tough childhood. I had a wonderful childhood. My parents loved me. I always knew they loved me. But they loved me with food, the same as your parents. Every single day, and this is not an exaggeration, I would run home at 3 o'clock from school, and find a brand new cake, a full cake. And the running joke for me was, we have to hide a piece for dad, because you'd eat the whole thing. And it wasn't untrue. And I got bigger and bigger and bigger. But nobody ever said I was getting heavy. They said I was getting big. As I got older and I became independent, I had a girlfriend that of course, birds attract birds that she liked to eat cake too. And on weekends, we would have like cake festivals. <laughs> and I'll never forget when those instant pies came out. We had a remarkable party that night. <laughs> and I recall the one weekend we went on a picnic and ate four instant pies. So no wonder I was having a hard time walking upstairs and breathing. So I had to change. Now, 
I didn't want to change. Nobody wants to change, you know. That's the hardest thing in the world to do. And so I had to find a reason to change. So I took the moral stance. And it was encouraged, by the way, by this yoga crazy vegetarian. And he knew I loved animals because I kept hugging and kissing my dogs. And he said, you're eating them. Now, that sounds sort of innocent and crazy when you're a grown adult. But it hit me. I never really thought of that. Can you imagine? Every day we ate meat several times. Never once did I think I was eating meat. Because back in those days, you'd go to the store and there'd be cellophane package over this red stuff that you cooked. And you had to eat it or you'd die from protein deficiency. And in one fell swoop, I gave up meat. Loving it, but gave it up. Dairy was the hardest one, because I couldn't take the moral stance on that one, because I didn't have the knowledge or information. Now I can. What they do to those dairy cows is just as bad as what they do to the poor animals. And that took me three years. But the biggest one, the S word, mm, that took decades. What's the S word? Sugar. Sugar. As a matter of fact, what we all do is we sort of hide that we're still eating sugar. You know, the first one we give up is white sugar. And then we walk around telling everyone, you know, we gave up sugar. What's that under your arm? Two gallon bottle of honey. <laughs> so once they figured out the honey's just like sugar, then all at once, the raw food, people started to say, don't worry, we have something that's raw, and it comes from a cacti, and it's agave syrup. And let me tell you, agave syrup, we now in science realize, is the worst sugar you can possibly eat. And there's no such thing as raw agave syrup, the other concern. It's all extracted at a minimum of 180 degrees. So I'm here tonight to tell you, it's not as easy as giving up meat and dairy. You have to give up sugar. And you want to lose weight, you have to give up sugar. And you want to stop perpetuating cancers and heart disease and diabetes and fungus and yeast and bacteria and mold, you've got to give up sugar. So at the Institute 60 years ago, as Anna Maria said, our doors opened 1956 because our founder just couldn't tolerate the fact that top doctors were telling people they were going to die and she reversed her disease. So she said something quite unique. Rather than I'm going to make money and be a holistic person, she said I'm going to teach people I'm going to educate people. I'm going to give people information so that they can make these changes on their own, and they don't need me. They don't need Hippocrates Health Institute. And so that's what we've been doing since 1956. Now, we, it's, we're a little slow, so it took us 30 years to figure out Boston was an unfavorable place to have an institute like this. <laughs> if you saw what the weather was like last week, that was sort of a good day in January. <laughs> And you think it's going to be over by April, but it usually ends around June 15th there. And so bottom line is we moved down here to West Palm Beach. And we have been having a lot of fun ever since that happened. Matter of fact, during the holidays, there was a point where we had people from 23 countries. This week, if you were knowing this, I had three major, major, major conferences. The top glutathione doctor in the world was with us the top biofrequency doctor from Germany that I met back in the autumn and brought in, and he spoke just two nights ago. The top compassion doctor last night that talked about the compassion and how the planet Earth is being destroyed, by the way, because you choose to eat meat and dairy. And because our culture, not all cultures, our culture has created a dependency on it because your government and governments worldwide literally fund and subsidize the meat and dairy industry. So when I really started to look at all of this, because I have one of these inquisitive minds, I started to say, give me the proof. I always need the proof. And I think the proof that you've got to understand is the first, foremost proof. There are millions of creatures on the planet Earth. We've cataloged and categorically placed names in computer programs and in libraries and know that there are millions of categories, 100% of them those creatures eat 100% raw food diet. The only species that does not eat 100% raw food diet is the human species. Now, I'd like you to challenge me on that. You're going to say, well, how about the horse we give the grain? You think out in the field, he'd say, hey, I want grain? What would a horse eat in the field? What would a gorilla eat? 
in the jungle. There is not a creature on Earth, not one species, including microscopic species, that do not consume 100% raw food diet. Now, there's a lot of theories, and the anthropologists throw a major wrench in this because they're completely wrong, that we evolved to eating meat, and that's how our brain grew. When we cooked food, our brain grew. Now, this completely goes against biochemistry and chemistry, anatomy, and physiology, because nothing dead makes anything grow. I recently spoke at a major medical conference with a quote group of 400 holistic doctors who are just as closed-minded because they think chelation therapy is what holistic medicine is. And I did a presentation that literally showed something that they were very uncomfortable with. First thing I showed, which you're going to see tonight, is a seed and what happens when you put it in water and give it oxygen and a little bit of sun. It germinates, and very rapidly. The second slide I showed them was I took that seed and cooked it. The third slide was I had a human hand taking the cooked seed and putting it in the ground. And the fourth slide, since I was being complimentary to the doctors, is even a scientist would know that if you put a cooked seed in the ground, it will not produce a living food. So why then do we put cooked food into our bodies and expect it to give us life? This institute for 60 years has had the great fortune for the smartest people and sometimes the sickest people in the world to show up. And we have watched what living food does. We have watched what uncooked, unfired food does in a plant-based form. The majority of the world today eats plant-based food. Six out of 10 people, their primary diet is plant-based diets. You go back and look at the Blue Zones. The Blue Zones went out and asked a very poignant question one that people should ask before they go on the paleo diets or the blood type diet or the macrobiotic diet, which I was on. <laughs> they should ask, who lives the longest and who's the healthiest? And so when they investigated that with the Blue Zones, guess what? They found five groups of people, not major countries or the United States or anything like that. We would be the last probably. But five little groups, and they were eating plant-based diets. So what we have to understand is that there's overwhelming evidence of what we're talking about and have proven, and nobody in the history of healthcare has done clinical research with lifestyle on humans for 60 years. We have. Our medical team, our medical doctors, literally take blood tests when people come in, blood tests when people leave, and we put them in files. Every once in a while, there is legitimate research, not very much, not very much. Most research is paid for by somebody that you don't want to pay for. And they come in and say, can you show us what's happened? And they're stunned. They're stunned. And we shouldn't be stunned by common sense, and we shouldn't be stunned from the things I'm talking about. We should be stunned that we have survived as long as we have under the conditions that we live in eating out of cans, eating out of processed food, taking pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, eating the carcasses of animals, taking milk out of their breast and thinking that's a normal thing. My latest book just came out three weeks ago called Dairy Deception. It puts a major focus on eggs and dairy with up to speed, as close back as two months ago, research that comes out. There are tsunamis of evidence of how dangerous it is to consume that. Tsunamis of evidence. My book several years ago, Killer Fish, they have you conned, even the alternative doctors have you conned in thinking fish and fish oil is good. How many of you know that every drop of fish and the crustaceans that we consume, like lobsters, etc., are carcinogens? Within 20 to 30 minutes after you extract that poor creature from its environment, it becomes rancid and that oil becomes carcinogenic. And by the way, the oil that happens to be called omega oils came from algaes that the fish consumed. What well, do you think it makes a little bit of sense that you then consume the algaes rather than the fish? Do you think it makes a little bit of sense that you consume the green leafy vegetable is where the protein comes from, the green leafy vegetable, rather than the animal that eats the green leafy vegetable? Now, you can debate all you want. And when I was an addict of food, I debated too. I went from white sugar to honey. I went from honey to maple syrup. I went from maple syrup, <laughs> the list went on. And finally, I realized I couldn't hide in the closet anymore. I was a sugar addict. 
And you're a food addict if you somehow are going to contort what we're talking about tonight. You saw Jackie. Jackie is one of tens of thousands of people that I've had the privilege to get to work with over the last 43 years. One of tens of thousands of people. I didn't tell Jackie to come here and tell this story. And as a husband who loves my wife and my four children and grandchildren, his words touched me deeply. And we didn't save her life. She had the courage to save her life because she had good sense enough to do what makes good sense. Don't deceive yourself because it's very late in the game now. We're in a circumstance and a situation, no matter what they tell you in the media, in major, major problems. That's where we are today. And it's getting worse by the day. In my book, Killer Fish, I report by 1940, uh, 2040, nine, that the ocean's fish will be gone. And how did I learn that? From a theory from the top oceanographic scientist in the world, who, by the way, I'm going to have speak at a major conference that we sponsor with my partner for free for 10 days with 23 truth tellers next May. From May the 23rd until May the 31st, you can drive four hours north of here to Orlando, Florida, to the Real Truth About Health conference, therealtruthabouthealth.com, where you can listen to me for 200 hours yelling at you about different subjects. But you can also for free come for 10 days to Orlando and listen to the top truth tellers in their field on every major important subject today. Some of my colleagues will be there, Dr. Esselstein, Dr. Campbell, Dr. Deal, Dr. Cousins, Dr. Furman, the list goes on. There's not a truth teller that will not be there. And we also are doing that not just for you to come, for us to be nice to you, but we're gonna air that and live stream it worldwide so that for free, people can watch it worldwide. And guess what? For years and years to come, for free, you can sit at home and watch 10 days of conference with truth tellers. If we don't change things now, people, there won't be a people and there won't be a thing to change. And it starts with diet. Dr. Openlander will be with us. Dr. Openlander is by far the number one most efficient scientist on the degradation of the planet Earth through the consumption of meat and dairy. When you listen to him in New York City in Times Square last year, where we held a three-day conference, he got a standing ovation. Because when you hear truth and it comes from the heart and it's not intellectual and it doesn't have any vested interest and nobody's making money on it, it's just pure, unadulterated truth. It touches you deeply. And let's hope you're touched deeply enough by yourself to make those significant changes necessary today. Because there's got to be leaders, not followers anymore. You've been led by the wrong people. You better start following yourself. So let's move on now to the scientific evidence. And we're going to make this simple. And some of you will be surprised where science is moving. Living food is food that is literally growing at the time that you bite into it versus a raw food. Now, I was out in California a few years ago screaming and yelling about how the food we get from California, ironically, we have this beautiful weather, but most of the organic food you get is from California, is at least three weeks old. And this big, tall truck driver stood up and said, I don't want to denounce what you said, but you're wrong. He said, I've been eating the Hippocrates diet along with my five children for a number of years, and all I do is haul from California around the country organic food. It's six weeks old. So I said, six weeks old, how is that possible? He said, we put nitrogen into it. So the nitrogen. So can you imagine how little you're literally getting out of a raw food? It's literally sitting there, looking like a food. That's why we call it recreational food, where a sprout, listen to this, a sprout can be up to 30 times, 30 times more nutritious than the most beautiful, organically grown green vegetable you can have in your own garden. Raw food, the next best fare to living foods, are often harvested weeks before the consumption. Look at this bountifulness, you know. If I look at my old plates, they call them brown foods today. 
Remember, the, all I had was a like, gravy. I didn't even see white, because the potato was covered with brown gravy. And you had this brown piece of flesh sitting there next to it. And by the way, in my house, the rare time to show off, we served vegetables. It was only to show off, because we didn't like them. They'd be in brown, yellowish butter. And you'd have to learn to be a spear fisherman to get them. <laughs> Germinated nuts, seeds, grains, beans, root vegetables, yes, you can germinate root vegetables, etc., possess 10 to 30 times more nutrition than the finest cultivated organic vegetables grown in pristine, rich soil. Another problem you have. How many of you know that Stanford University came out with a study about three years ago and said, when they looked at commercially grown foods nutrition and organically grown foods nutrition from commercial organic growers, there was no difference in nutritional value. And all my friends said they're lying, and I said they're right. Because now you have hundreds of thousands of acres from major, major, mega organic growers that have two to three, maybe four percent organic soil. For food to have nutritional value, you ought to have 20 to 25 percent organic soil. And if you ever go to a place like Josh's Market close by, they grow it in 25 percent organic soil, the difference and the shape and the size of these foods are dynamically, completely the opposite. Healthcare's foremost neglect has been the haunting absence of the knowledge that our bodies require energetic substance to function at primary as well as exceptional levels. So up until now, and I'll tell you why, because we're not that far along in, in nutritional science. Any of you know when nutritional science literally began and where it began? 1928, now for the young people here, you think that's a long time, it wasn't that long ago. 1928, that was the year my mother was born, and it was at Cornell University. There was no science of nutrition. The first nutrient we ever identified was only in 1905. That was a B vitamin. So we're pretty young at this stuff. And up until now, when you talk about nutrition, they have taken it over and said proteins, vitamins, minerals, essential fats. Now, they're all pretty important, but they're nowhere near as important as the most important nutrition. What do you think the most important nutrition is? The electromagnetic frequency in food. Now, why would electromagnetic frequency be more important than a protein? What are you made of? Are you flesh, bones, and blood, or are you an electromagnetic person? Now, if you don't know you're an electromagnetic person, I'll make it blatantly clear to you. If one of you stood up, fell down, and stopped breathing, I would not get supplements and give them to you. What would I give you? An electric shock. Because your electric body requires electric. And in the 21st century and since 1956, we knew this. And this is why people come back to life. And this is why when you put life force into your body, it protects the cells from free radical damage. We've known since 1954 how you get sick, every single disease, as well as how you prevent the premature aging process, is to prevent the electromagnetic frequency we call free radicals from killing healthy cells. Now, they're still talking about antioxidants, and ironically, over 90% of the antioxidants in bottles on the market kill cells because they're made of chemical supplements. You should read my book, Supplements Exposed. By default, I became the leading authority in the world on supplementation. Now, that's pretty sad that I had to become that because I was the first one that told you 91% of supplements were dangerous for you to take, including most of what an alternative doctor gives you. Be very, very cautious. Living food consumption not only properly nourishes and builds healthy anatomy and cell structure, it expands and accelerates potential for consciousness. So how many of you have been on raw food and started to feel differently? Started to see differently? Started to feel differently? And that's because your body has more electric in it than you can imagine, but what part of your body has the most electric is called neurons in the brain. 
And if you are not giving electric to the neurons in the brain, you're on half speed. It's like a light bulb flickering on the way out. That's why we have these brain fogs and so-called ADDs and dyslexia. You've got to remember, people, we are completely wrong in mainstream thinking on nutrition. Watch the beauty of this. It's just remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Can you imagine the power it takes and requires for, the, for this to happen? What do you think these are? Do you know? No, nope. peas. If you up north, the very first thing in April and May that pop out of the ground are peas. They're just powerfully strong. And we use pea sprout juice in every green drink. Starting last two months ago, we began to put Tulsi, which is called holy basil, which is a weed we now grow at Hippocrates in our green juice. We put sunflower. Recently, the University of Tehran told us something we didn't know, and we brought sunflower greens to the world that has an anti-cancer phytochemical in it. So let's give nature a gigantic hand for this beautiful. <laughs> so when you think about this, you know, somehow we look at a plant. That's a plant. It's you. Can you imagine if you take not one, but I assume in a day I'm eating probably 20,000 of these plants, juicing them and eating them. 20,000 of those plants that have the ability, each one, to do what you've just seen. Now, if you don't think that brings you back to life, you're not thinking clear. And this is why we see people within two weeks and three weeks radically change. We see case after case, week after week, where people come in, they cannot walk, they cannot stand up, Many times they're in wheelchairs, and we bring music in. It's not just a tough place like a hospital, and we dance, and they're dancing by the third week. And this is not uncommon. It's not the rare case. It's a common thing. Now, that's a photograph of what a sprout looks like. And I'm going to say something before it's written on the board. Back when I began all of this, I joined the Hippocrates team in the mid-70s. I got a call from a gentleman that I became very close friends with shortly after called Dr. Rick Ricketts. Dr. Rick Ricketts was a top orthodontist in the world. He wrote the books on orthodontia. So if you go to school today, many years even after his death, he's the author of those books. And what he did is said to me, there's a Russian scientist here who's the leading authority in the world on energetic field testing and we've never done it on food. Can we do it? And so this is from the Synergy Company, and that was part of those studies. What we found is with a sprout, it literally has two feet in every direction surrounding it, electromagnetic energy. Now from this, because it's on a screen, you don't see the colors are gold, white, and purple. And what we know from those colors, they have the highest amount of hertz highest amount of frequency. Now, we're not going to show you in this demonstration. We could be here for the next four days. But my colleague who just passed on last year, who was co-authoring my newest book that will be out this year, called Quantum Human Biology. But I'm going to write it so you'll understand it. But it's my contribution to the scientific community for the future of healthcare and medicine. She actually did motion films of people eating sprouts, and before that, eating the typical American diet. So here was a gentleman we sat down, not we, she sat down in 1983 at UCLA. He was one of the athletes. And every time his Adam's apple went up and down and the hamburger went down and the French fry went down and the soda went down, you watched his electromagnetic energy reduce to nothing. He had no projection of fields. Stood him up. Gave him two quarts of water, 10 minutes later photographed him, put him on these foods, and you saw absolutely the opposite happen. 
So the new world, the 21st century world of nutrition that you better start learning about is your electric, and we need to give you the electric the way it was meant to come to you, the way every other single creature on Earth except you get it from raw, unadulterated food. And the top, the hierarchical part of that food is raw living sprouts, algaes, blue-green algae and green algae, the first life form on the planet that created oxygen. You would not be here without it, this blue-green and green algae. The oceans then came with the salt in it. Then it was sea vegetables. These are the primary foods. You talk about primal foods. You talk about foods that were the original foods. These were the foods. Over the past few decades, we at Hippocrates have conducted research into the electrical frequency of our food and the effect that electrical charge has on the frequency of healthy cells. In conjunction with the photographic research conducted at UCLA in the mid-70s, which measured the relative energy level in different foods, we have created a list of foods from highest to lowest in energy content. This is in my book, Life Force. That I think we have that here tonight. But here are some of these beautiful foods. Can you imagine these? So when you see people who eat this way, sometimes they actually have that electrical glow. Did you notice that? I'll never forget, many years ago, I was in Toronto, Canada, and they had this poor woman who they put on a panel with three raw foodists. And she happened to be telling everyone they would die if they didn't eat meat. And she was gray, and she was yellow, and she was angry, and she was nasty. And after a three-hour panel discussion, the first question was, I don't have to listen to what you say. They're glowing, and you're gray. And I never thought I'd be defending somebody. I felt so bad for her, I defended her. <laughs> I said, maybe, she's good. maybe it was the lighting here, I said. <laughs> it was the lighting. So you want to put that into you, so you start lighting up yourself. Rating the life force energy in our foods. Why are wheatgrass, sprouts, and edible weeds at the top of the list? Anyone know? Why do you think wheatgrass, sprouts, and edible weeds are right at the top of the list when it comes to chlorophyll? chlorophyll. And why chlorophyll is because it collects the most energy from the sun. 24 hours a day, the sun projects protons to the planet Earth. Evolution created green leafy plants starting with water varieties to receive this energy charged food. The frequency converts to energy and protein manifesting a wide array of viable nutrients. Consuming life force food raises the electrical frequency of cells so that you can combat every known disorder. So now if Jackie goes as she is to Yale University and being tested, she's smart enough because she's a doctor not to tell him what happened is that the light bulb went out in her cell and now it came back on and that's why she's well. <laughs> but that's really what happened. <laughs> That's really what happened. Now, isn't that sexy? You know, other than my wife, this is the most romantic thing I, I think about. When I close my eyes at night, let's all close our eyes. Close our eyes and think about how sexy that is. And, and when I close my eyes, this is what I end up seeing. <laughs> now, let's do that again. Next time, I'll put a guy on there. That's right, I know. But we want it to be really sexy in this case. So now close your eyes, see if you can do this. Maybe you can manifest a, a, a stud there for that one. Next time I'll put a stud. There you go. Whoa! <laughs> so you eat those, you eat those things, and before you know it, you'll be dancing around with high heels on too, especially you. <laughs> we can talk about Rick Ricketts in 76, funded a study. Most varieties of soil grow in germinated seeds projected an energy field of two feet in every direction surrounding the plant. Among varieties tested were wheatgrass, sunflower, pea shoots, and buckwheat greens. In each case, the colors measured were white, gold, and purple. On the measurement scale used, these represented this. The white is actually, as you see here, 2,500 hertz. Gold, 2,100 hertz and purple, 1,700 hertz. Now what's interesting, I was just talking to somebody when I was in Europe in the autumn that explained to me that why certain um, sounds, certain notes in music literally make 
these plants grow better is they actually project hertz out of the sound of the, the note. Isn't that amazing too? So you can increase the development of a plant by putting a certain music in. And the one they like the most, believe it or not, is Beethoven's Knife. Out of all the music they've tested, Beethoven's Knife. So if you want health, healthy plants, that's what you need. Fully healthy and functional cells vibrate at 75 hertz as measured by Dr. Valerie Hunt. Now, Dr. Hunt, she was a deer, you know. Uh, several years ago when I thought to myself, I've got to write the book on you know, quantum biology to show you that your frequency, you're not really biology. I started to do it for three days, and then I realized I don't know enough. So I picked up the phone and called her. She was really not a close friend, but an acquaintance. And I said to Valerie, who was in California, Valerie, will you co-author it? She said, I've been waiting for somebody to call. Get your butt on a plane and come out here. And she was, at that point, 96 years old. And we sat many, many hours. I would fly back and forth and brought her to the Institute once or twice. And we were on our way, and she passed on not long ago. And I almost gave up because she was the brains. You know, she was really cute. I would come up with these concepts, and she'd say, that's great, but let's look at it this way. <laughs> and most of the time, she made it a much, much better thing than I was thinking about. But then I thought to myself, I can't do it because of her name. We're well through this. So I started to contact physicists around the world. So I'm working with a Russian physicist out of the University of St. Petersburg that got a new dimension, a Romanian-American physicist out of Texas. And again, Dr. Volet, who was just there this week, who's the top biofrequency doctor in all of the world out of Germany. And so together we're going to do it. And it's going to be a better contribution to science because now we have more minds working with it. When consuming this high hertz variety of food, and taking into account the necessary energy required to digest, eliminate, and alkaline acid processing, they support your trillions of cells to be functioning at their perfect level. Even organic raw food, such as lettuce, is measured at only 1,000 hertz. Corn, 2,500, I mean 275 hertz. Within 30 minutes after removing it from soil, all raw food dramatically plummets to below 50 hertz. Now, did I say 30 days? I said 30 minutes. Can you imagine how little energy you have in a food within two, three, five days, 10 days, six weeks? How many of you know who the Heart Math Institute is? Well, at least one or two of you, but this is a great story, so I'm going to tell a story. There's a group of people out of my generation that knows that, know that everything is electromagnetic frequency. Now, we've been talking about you and how you function, but guess what? The chair you're sitting on is electromagnetic frequency. What's invisible between us that you consider air is electromagnetic frequency. Do you know that you're now connected to people 10,000 miles away? That what they're doing, you don't know it because you're so used to your state you're in, is affecting you now. Now, the only time we seemingly notice that we're connected to one another is when a very traumatic global event occurs. Is that not true? Then all at once, everyone realizes we're connected. But guess what? You're connected when we have loving events and no events, and you're sleeping at night, and you're dancing in the street. All of this stuff is connected. So heart math realized that, but there was nobody measuring it. Nobody could prove this until very recently. So let's talk about their brilliant work. Heart Math Institute has been efficient in measuring the interconnectedness between all life forms. Similarly, work conducted at UCLA in the 70s and 80s scientifically displayed the overall measurable increase of biofrequency in a person's anatomy after they consume living foods. One of the foundational reasons of why we at Hippocrates Health Institute have utilized freshly made, immediately consumed sprout juice for its healing properties is the enormous increase in immune system cell function via the inoculation of these electrically charged nutrients. So in 60 years, with all these people like Jackie who say they get well, we don't make them well. Isn't that wonderful? We're the truth tellers. Even the alternative types are going to tell you, I'm going to heal you. If anyone tells you you're going to heal you, you know you're in the wrong hands. The only one that can heal you is who? You, period. You're the only one that can heal you. I cannot heal you, unless you have a God complex and think you can heal people. But the fact of the matter is, heart mass said, let's prove this. 
So they took the most sophisticated computers, put 65 of them all over the planet Earth. All over the planet Earth. And they're going right now 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Then a major event that touched your heart deeply called 9-11 happened. These computers have at random mathematics at random 24 hours a day running. Guess what happened? They all organized. Every computer organized the same mathematical equations for about a one week period. And then slowly but surely went back to at random mathematics. Now, what does that mean? We have a way to monitor and measure electromagnetic connectivity. Now, we don't know what it means yet, but we have proof of it for the first time. Tsunami happened three to three and a half days. We lost 275,000 lives in the tsunami in Indonesia. Same thing happened, a global event. So the next step, hopefully in the next few years, we're gonna be able to explain what that is. I know that the future of medicine is not gonna be chemistry. It's gonna be electromagnetic. That's why at Hippocrates, for the last 35 years, under my directorship, I've been bringing in the latest technologies in electromagnetic and laser frequencies. So it's not just food. The food is the natural occurring way that you get electromagnetic frequency. But what if you're sick? I have to supercharge you with a laser. I have to supercharge you with electromagnetics. I have to do biofrequency with a cyber scan or an undermed machine. I have to pump your lymphatic system and move energy through it with an H-wave unit. And this is where the whole future is going for healthcare. Sprouts are germinated from the seeds of a wide variety of plants. They contain a power plant of energy and nutrient fuel that is built into the structure so that they can create large plants that often spawn thousands of other seeds. Now think about that. The one I always refer to is a, a sunflower. You can take a little tiny black sunflower, put it in the ground, and in seven weeks, it's a 15-foot plant with thousands of seeds on it that move. Each of those plants move. In the morning, it's facing the east. At night, it's facing the west. Now again, probably in a day, on one tray, there is about 1,500 to 2,000 of these. I'm probably consuming two of those trays. That can do what? Grow each of those three, 4,000 plants can grow plants that have thousands of seeds on them. Now, if you don't get that that's good for you, if you don't get that that's going to give you energy, I don't know how else to tell you that. Now, the interesting thing is when you haven't been eating this way and you begin to eat this, you don't feel energy right away because the energy from the food starts to clean your body out. So it's like getting on a wild horse. As long as you stay on the horse and tame it, you're going to have a great relationship with the horse. But if you jump off and say, that's too much for me, because that energy is now cleaning you and changing and shifting the biochemistry, you'll probably think it's not working. This eruption of rich substance is why sprouts are the most nutritious land-based food. Nature created natural occurring pesticides for each of these seeds so that they would never perish from the plague of pests or creatures. Now, isn't this interesting? So man created bad pesticides, but the original pesticides were created millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of years before you were alive. Millions of years. First life form on the planet, again, was blue-green algae and its brother, green algae. It had something in it that protected it from other life forms. Now, the most interesting thing, in 1948, a research scientist was looking through his microscope, and the Petri dish that you use to capture things had bacteria on it. And he was messing with vegetables. And he saw an element come out of the vegetable and attack the bacteria and kill it. And this got his mind working. And he said, let's put a fruit on there, and let's put a virus on there, and let's put another vegetable on it, and let's put a mold on there. And he started to categorically prove that there was an element. Nobody knew what it was. He didn't know what it was. And these were the pesticides, natural occurring pesticides in food that we today have labeled as something called a phytonutrient, a phytochemical. Have you ever heard about this before? 
the most powerful medicine ever discovered in the history of science. I once again repeat so you understand what I've just said to you. The most powerful medicine, medicine, more than herbs, more than homeopathic, more than pharmaceuticals, ever discovered in the history of medical science. These natural safety mechanisms literally have become phytochemicals that search out and kill every disease. Researchers in the case of sulforaphane related to cancer elimination actually call this nutrient a phytochemo. That was coined at Johns Hopkins in 1992. The two cancer doctors, oncologists, that were part of that research said the most powerful one had worked over 50 years in cancer research. The most powerful medicine they ever discovered was from a broccoli sprout. Broccoli is great, so eat raw broccoli. But if you want 50 times, I didn't say five, I said 50 times more anti-cancer medicine sprout the seed of a broccoli. But you know what else is good and a little bit less expensive? Cabbage. Cabbage sprouts. And onion sprouts. And garlic sprouts. And now we know from the University of Tehran, not quite as much, and not so fame, but another element that fights cancer from sunflower greens. Now who should be concerned about cancer here? Everyone better raise your hand. Because 57% of the population will contract cancer in their life now. 57% of us. On average, one pound of seeds render 10 pounds of highly nutritious food. So I take one pound of seed, I get 10 pounds of highly nutritious food. Once again, in the case of sunflower, it's a complete protein. It has essential fats in it. it. has practically every single vitamin in it. And if it's growing in rich soil like we do, it has all the minerals in it too. And if you have some minerals that are lacking today, like selenium, you can add that to the soil. Easy stuff. Most of you don't know. And do you know what? I can go to the poorest places, which I have. I've been there to the poorest places and to the villages with hungry and starving people and show them how they can eat the most nutritious food in the world, highest protein food in the world for pennies. Shame on us. Shame on us for starvation. Shame on us that we have over half a million young American children going to bed hungry every night. Shame on us that we subsidize farmers and tell them not to grow food. Shame on us that we let genetic modification go on. Shame on us. Watch these beautiful little creatures. These are mung bean sprouts. You notice all the Asian foods have them in. Now we know they're complete protein. We know if you have premature graying of the hair or balding, you better eat them. Breast problems or prostate problems, you better eat them. Because they're just filled with zinc. So gray hair, balding, breast, Prostate problems, a lot of colds, a lot of flus. Get those inexpensive Chinese bean sprouts. Look at them, they dance. Isn't that extraordinary how they're dancing there? Just remarkable stuff. They look like ballerinas, don't they? And see, nature even takes their protective coat off. These come to full fruition in six days. And you know they cost nothing practically? Give them a hand again, come on. <laughs> 10 reasons to start sprouting. We'll go through this very, very quickly. Economics, nutrition, they're all organic. You say, I'm not sure I'm getting organic food. Guess what? You can be sure. You can grow it in your bedroom if you want to. You can be sure. Availability. Oh, I don't want to go out. It's too hot because I'm in July in Miami or in January in Boston. Quite available. You know, get on the internet. Buy 50-pound bags of seeds. They cost a lot less. Store them in your house. In Boston, we had a major snowstorm in 1970s that literally paralyzed the city and closed it for one week. Seven days, no cars, no planes, no trucks could come in or out of Boston. It was beautiful. <laughs> People were skiing. 
up and down the streets, the main streets. It was just remarkably beautiful and quiet. I never slept better. I was like a baby sleeping in those days. And the Boston Globe came to see us because we had stuck in that house between the guest and the team members that lived there, 175 people. And we weren't smart enough to recognize this, but they said, by the way, we hear you grow food in the middle of Boston, in the heart of Boston. Could you tell us how long you could stay in this house without ever going out to buy food? And again, we weren't smart enough to do it. But thank God, one of the guests was, happened to be a professor of mathematics. And we went downstairs, and in 30 minutes, he came up and said, nobody would have to leave this house, 175 people, for any nutritional need for the next two and a half years. Thank God we had just gotten a delivery a month before of seeds. Then we have space and time. People say, I have no space. Do you know how many small apartments all around the world grow this? They take one tray like this. You know, you can go to uh, a, a rest, not a restaurant. You can go to a restaurant supply house if you want a fancy one. You can go to Kmart and buy a plastic tray for probably $30. And on that one tray at my house, we used to feed all my four children and Anna Marie and I on one tray like that. And then have from the bottom, we'd start them, and up to the top, and as they got more and more growing, they'd be to the top. And how much did that cost? Practically nothing. Then we also have freshness. We talk about fresh food. What, California lettuce, six weeks old, fresh food. <laughs> or how about what's popping in your mouth? Digestibility. People say, I can't digest raw food. The only food you can digest is raw food. Did you know that? Once you cook a food, it's not digestible. Just because you don't feel it doesn't mean it's digesting. You're so unused to food, as I was, I never ate a food in my life until I began this. Everything dead would slip from here and slip out the back. I didn't feel it and said, it's digesting. <laughs> well, bottom line is, as your body becomes familiar with real food, living food, it takes time. But boy, it really nourishes you. Versatility. People say, we want versatility. I started to realize years ago, there's hundreds and thousands of different seeds. Hundreds and thousands of different seeds. That each and every one, in my book, Life Force, one of the things I'm most proud of writing in my entire life is what I jokingly call the sprout pharmacy. And it goes from A to B to C, and it tells you what that sprout has in it and what disorder it helps to prevent. And then meals, you can have whole meals and ecology. Again, meat and dairy consumption is destroying the planet Earth. Period, hands down, no question. This does the exact reversal. If I get an average of 10 pounds from one pound, that means I need 10 times less land to grow, in this case, food that's spectacularly nutritious. Look at the broccoli there, and you look what each one. We just spoke about that, cabbage. Fenugreek. Uh, Harvard did a study and showed they didn't even change people's diets. They literally put them on fenugreek, and the diabetics were starting to have blood sugar regulate. If you have gastrointestinal problems, fenugreek and their juices. Hops. Guess what? That takes care of brain activity, neuron activity, calms people down. Yes, you can get the seed of a hops. Inpatient flowers helps the hair and vision. You can eat those little seeds when you sprout them. Kale, sprouts. We're not thinking about kale, sprouts of kale. You can eat kale sprouts if you have thyroid problems, but you can't eat kale. You realize that, right? So the big push on kale now, great. But 50% of young women and older women today have thyroid concerns. You don't want kale. Mango. What do you mean mango? You can sprout a mango? Yeah. Don't eat the mango. Give it to somebody you don't like. Take the seed. Sprout it, that little tree, as long as you're not allergic to mango, that little tree that comes up, eat it before it's three inches tall. Amazingly good. Look what a mango can do for the gallbladder, cholesterol reduction. Mung bean, we spoke about. Nuts, every single week I'm reading new research on nuts and the extraordinary benefit nuts have. And when you germinate them, they become easy to digest. You look at onions. You know, ulcers as well as helping the sulforaphane. Oregano. You always think of oregano as a leaf that you use as seasoning. Guess what? Oregano is phenomenally good. And what do you think that's good for? Anti-yeast, antifungal. 
pea sprouts, which we use in every one of our juices, strengthen teeth, stimulate the H cell. Quinoa, you all eat it, it's the hip thing today, but guess what, when you sprout it, what does that do for you? It gives you energy. Sesame, in the Middle East, the term open sesame came about because they realized it saved their life when they had no other food. They could sustain life on sesame because it's a complete protein, extraordinary for calcium, etc. Sunflower seeds, we've talked about. Teff, Ethiopian grain. Endocrine system, cardiovascular system. Tomatoes, amazing what we now know about tomatoes. What we talk about tomatoes is not only cardiovascular, but cancer concerns today, and specifically breast-related. Water chestnuts. You think there's something you have in Asian food. How about if you sprout them? How much more are you going to get from a water chestnut? Well, you look at what it does. It helps the kidneys, in this case. Wild yam. Everyone's worrying about their hormones, and you should, because we're all filled with estrogens. Some of you even eat healthy, organic, living food diets, but you wear polyester bras and underwear. So you're filled with wacky estrogens at this point. You want to help to regulate that? Get off, get rid of the polyesters, eat this way, and by the way, take wild yams and sprout them. And they actually call it the rheumatism root in some countries. Now watch wheatgrass grow. Phenomenally interesting when you look at this stuff. This all happens in just a short time. Amazingly beautiful when you start to look at it. And how they all know how to work together. I wish humans could do that. We could work like a gathering of sprouts. We'd be much better off. Look at them wiggling there. They look like Presley. <laughs> I remember him. He was doing that all of the time. Brian likes this. This turns Brian on over there. Brian's our sprout grower at Hippocrates. Give him a hand. He's our pharmacist. Most guys like him like girls. He likes sprouts. <laughs> I know, he likes both. <laughs> so the new, the new science is what we're talking about today. There's no doubt about this. So my book, Food is Medicine, my series of books, it's a three-volume series I write for this, wrote for the scientific community, talks about all of this, talks about the five. I got tired when I go out to the medical groups. They always said, give me the research. I gave them so much, they won't even read it. They, you know, I give them 1,200 pages, three volumes, and they don't like it. I'll give them another three volumes, and I'll give them another three volumes. Let them keep squawking, because there is more evidence than you can imagine on this. You could give your life up and just read the science on this today. And so you may want to read these. If you're heady, great stuff for you. Each one of these talk about breast cancer and sprouts, diabetic and sprouts, antioxidant. Each one major universities we're talking about here. Every one of these. Skin cancers they talk about. Bladder cancers we talk about. So let's give a hand to food as medicine. Now what we're going to do is over there, if you notice on the right part of the room, there's something called a microphone. How many of you like to speak into a microphone? Hmm. We're not going to have too many questions, but this young guy and this young guy and that pretty woman, get her go to first. You stand up there and ask a question because we're filming this now. Come on, stand in line over there. Come on up, stand in line. Anyone else, don't be shy. They're going to ask questions. So loud and clear, and if I don't know the answer, I promise I'll make something up. <laughs> I love what I heard, and uh, I read the book. Are you Jimi Hendrix relative? <laughs> I could be. I'm from that generation, though. Yes. <laughs> um, even though I do believe a lot of it, I'd like to challenge you on some parts of it. I uh, have also healed myself from uh, prostate cancer, uh, stage three or above, uh, but not completely following your material. I'd like to educate myself more. What I want to challenge you on is that what has been puzzling me is some studies, such as if you're familiar with Weston A. Price yes. Institute, yes. that he says, you know, some people were in their deathbed and then only the only thing that revived them was broth of, you know, chicken or, or beef or what have you. Yes. Uh, and the B12 vitamin and all of that. That's my number one question, and then I have a couple of other Well, that's a great one, because remember the pale lady that I spoke about that I had to defend on the panel in Canada? Mm. She's passed on from cancer, by the way. 
So when I was starting to write my books back in the 1970s, I referred to Price's brilliant work, how he always referenced people who ate plants. And this young generation that you happen to be in, in, embraced by at this point completely hijacked his work and he exhumed out of his body of works that basically said eat plant-based diets and said he said to eat animal-based diets. His cat studies basically talked about raw living food, not animal-based foods. And so what you're hearing is completely the opposite of what Price was standing for. This happens quite often after the leaders die. The other thing I may say to you is that prolonged removal of disease is what you're optimally looking for. When anyone changes their diet, you're going to change temporarily your chemistry. That temporary change quite often gives what I call a honeymoon effect. After 43 years working with the sickest people in the world, thousands of people with prostate cancer, they're short-term honeymoons quite often. You want long-term lifestyle. That's what you want. And I promise you, if you can keep eating animal foods, read my book, for instance, uh, that just came out three weeks ago called Dairy Deception. The most grievous food today that anyone can ever consume as far as all the body of evidence show for prostate is dairy food. You want to give yourself prostate cancer. Forget if you have it or had it, get it that way. Meats are a close second, starting with fish, chicken, pork, red meat. I don't care if it's quote organic or not. You know, basically it stays in the body for three days, including fish. It leaves three acids behind, gives saturated fat to the body, reducing oxygen, goes back to Warburg's work, won a Nobel Prize for in 31. It was conducted in 24, which is all being redone today by the leading, leading researchers in the world. Don't, lead, don't read the people selling health books. Read the people who are doing the real science. Mm. Read Thomas Seif uh, Seifried out of Boston College. I had him come and speak at the Institute in May. He'll tell you why you don't want to eat animal fats to reduce oxygen, because that is a great way to lead to more cancer and have cancer come back. So number one, congratulations, rather than beat you up for being brave enough to go against the grain. So give him a hand for that one. Thank you. Uh, the biggest problem with cancer, of course, is the capital S you were talking about. <laughs> for me, uh, as much of an addict as I am for sugar, the way I took myself away from the sugar was taking a lot of meat and leafy green and uh, right. uh, sprouts and so on. That was all with the nuts and everything. But if you also want to give up the meat, uh, what suggestion do you have that they can overcome that? I'll addiction? repeat for the third time tonight. The highest protein diet in the world is the diet I'm talking about. Do I look like I'm starving of protein? You're probably a younger man than me. How old Not are you? 62. You're Becoming a younger man than me. I'm in my mid-60s. Okay. I lift weights, heavy, heavy weights, three days a week, no matter where I am in the world, 365 days a year. I haven't aged a day five years into doing this. And my latest research and a book I started one month ago is called Sweet Disease, because I'm tired of the science saying to me, sugar doesn't feed cancer. Do you know how much evidence there is? I could write a 5,000-page book on that. Stanford University, Cancer Institute. I do a presentation, by the way. Tonight, we're not doing that one. We have several hundred hours of presentations on here. But there you go. Yeah. So congratulations giving sure. up. But meat is not what you want. You want the highest protein food. To give an example, red meat, which you and I were conned as kids, were a great source, is only 19% protein. If you're willing to slaughter the animal, drink the blood out of its neck. Now, the way you choose to eat it, it's not a complete protein. Once you cook meat, it's not a complete protein. Did you know that? Okay, so with that said, you want 54% protein that digest in 15 minutes? Take blue-green algae. What I do with guys like you to get over the sugar, and you're exactly right, protein regulates sugar. You're just eating the wrong one. You're eating a dangerous protein. You put in your, and you don't even need the blue-green algae. That's more expensive. Take the chlorella, little baby tablets. Stick it in your pocket. Every time you want a candy bar or a cake, I wish I knew this. Pop three, four, five in your mouth. 15 minutes, it regulates blood sugar. I get people with type 2 diabetes a lot, lot, lot better, quicker with that. With people who are eating major proteins, this takes it away because this is real protein, not one that you stick in the body for three days, pulls energy out. Do you know how much animal protein takes out of the body in energy? Take a wild guess. You take, I'll give you the two, red meat and chicken. Which takes more energy out of the body? Chicken. Believe it or not, chicken takes more energy. Red meat takes 15,000 times more 
energy out of the body than it gives you, chicken takes 16.5 out of the body because it takes that much time. And why the chicken? Chicken has more what? Saturated fat. Chicken actually has more saturated fat than steak. Not, not the breast. Well, depending upon what you eat, but chicken generally has. Don't eat the breast. What do you like, breast? <laughs> I know you do, but not that kind. <laughs> All right, thank you. And last question about B12. For B12, again. now that I'm the guy. So what happened to me is we were the come to place in the whole world for plant-based diets and B12 because we had thousands of blood tests. Remember, we don't have theories, like guys who write books who know nothing. We, what is that, somebody's messing around here? Okay. So what we do is we do blood tests and we collect them and our medical team looks at them. You've got to understand that 18, 19 years ago, I held a major international conference for the raw food leaders at Hippocrates because I was tired of the salesmen lying to you. Agave syrup, chocolate, goji berries, I got tired of it. I said, these, these poor people don't know better, they're hurting people out there. That's not a healthy diet. That has nothing to do with a healthy diet. So what we basically did is get together, and who was sitting next to me is my buddy, Gabriel Cousins, and on the other side is a guy called George Malcolmus. And within about 20 minute period, Bo said to me, did you read the Framingham study on B12? Now when a guy who likes science hears Framingham, we get on our knees and kiss people's feet. Framingham is the only group of scientists that nobody ever denounces, fights about, or challenges. You know, they're the guys who came up with the cholesterol stuff, most of the cardiovascular things. We really get what they do. They did a study where they were doing urine testing versus blood testing and found out blood testing was completely faulty on B12. So now this completely freaks me out because I'm running around like a peacock telling everyone on the Hippocrates diet you don't have a B12 deficiency. So now I go rampant. Every time I got a chance, I'd be on a lecture tour, I'd be in a, in a medical library, start to look at paintings and sketchings and then eventually photographs in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and discovered after three years, I was like bonkers for three years, that starting hundreds and hundreds of years ago, that the large intestine, and why I looked at the large intestine, because B12 is not a B vitamin. It's a soil-based bacteria. It comes from soil. It was literally shaped completely differently. It used to have at the very bottom of this very elongated part that slowly over the centuries went away. Now we have this blunt part with this appendix that in most cases is shriveled up at the bottom. So this Everything was organic before 1945. Did you know that? You didn't have an option to buy pesticide-riddled food. You couldn't say, hey, could you give me something for less money called pesticide food? <laughs> Everything was organic. So the organic food, after it went through the body, ileocecal valve out of the small intestine would go down and drop and sit in this and culture. It would actually culture itself. It's gone. So the one supplement I can look you in the eye without even looking you in the eye and say you better take is a bacterial form of B12. Problem with that is nine out of 10 are chemicals. I've also discovered that 70% of the population worldwide lacks B12. Now hold your horses. Meat, dairy, fish eaters have an 8% higher incidence of B12 deficiency. Now our hypothesis before made a little sense. You're eating an animal, they have B12, why? Their teeth and their beaks are on the ground, but then what do you do with it? Bacteria is very sensitive to heat. Do you follow that? So you kill the bacteria. Living, living, food vegetarians, living food vegetarians actually have the least B12 deficiencies, but we all take B12. So the one supplement that you better take for the rest of your entire life is a bacterial form of B12, the type that we tell people to take, that I take, give my children, give my grandchildren, et cetera. Okay, You're welcome. Sorry, last thing, you said uh, University of Tehran. Yes. What, uh, do you mean Tehran? Tehran. Yes. Iran? Yes, Iran. Yeah. Okay. By the way, Iran happens to be a very civilized nation. How many of you know that they're one of the I'm highest? Iran you originally. know. They happen to be one of the highest educated group of people today in the world. So a lot that you hear on the media is baloney. On but this they side. are prisoners of yes. a very... I agree with you. I agree with you. But it doesn't mean that they're not smart. <laughs> That's right. Like now, all yeah, corrupted. <laughs> yes. Hi, I would like to find out, you mentioned in your lecture, in your speech, um, blue-green algae and green algae. Yes. What's the difference between those two? Is That's one more potent than the other, or? 
It doesn't matter which one we take. Well, it does matter. You know, blue-green algae is collected in nature. Uh, you don't grow that at this point other than spirulina uh, in man-made uh, situations. So it collects minerals, trace minerals, and essential fats at a little bit higher level. Green algae is always collected chlorella in man-made situations. Has 52% protein versus 54. That's close. So 2% is no big deal. But the essential fats in the blue-green algae is a little higher. Still, you get the essential fats in the green algae. And what we choose to do is, rather than debate it, is we take five types of algae, one green, three blue-green, and one phytoplankton, which is the third. Phytoplankton happens to be an extraordinary one from the oceans. And if you can do that, it's the best way to go. And the one, the phytoplankton, you said? The, uh, I phytoplankton, found, yes. Exactly. I found one in powder. Is it okay? I don't know. You'd have to show it to me, to be honest with okay. you. you know, Sometimes the powders are great, but how did they dehydrate it? Was it under 115 yeah. degrees? You know, these are the questions yeah. you ask. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Um, my question, originally, he already asked it. So since I stood up, I'm just going to ask something. What can I eat so I can lose weight but still be able to grow some muscle? I'm 15, and That's you want right. to get better right. shape. If you want muscle, you need to, number one, rip the muscle. Uh, protein does not put muscle on you. So you know that. So people could eat 20 pounds of protein powder a day, the greatest protein powder of these algaes, you're not going to gain an ounce. So that's a myth. If you rip your muscle through lifting weight and then take exceptional protein, that's how you build muscle. So when I'm building muscles by lifting heavy weight, it's because I'm eating these high protein diets, but heavy, heavy weights, and don't just start heavy weights, you know, slowly work to heavy weights. That rips it, and then you rebuild it that way. The other thing is sprouted grains and sprouted beans slow down your metabolism and give you a better advantage than proteins do to gain weight, gain muscle weight. Isn't that interesting? So it's not the protein that does it first. It's literally. What happened to me is I went from this big obese guy to this really skinny guy. So I had to start eating sprouted grains and sprouted beans, the carbohydrate, with a little protein to slow down my metabolism so I could then build a little muscle. Because 82% of muscle comes from fat. How many of you knew that? And one of the other myths is they tell people who are heavy, like I was, do aerobic. Now, aerobic's important, and you need to do it, but it doesn't really take fat off as much as bodybuilding. If you bodybuild, you can convert. If I took a chubby person and really worked them out for six months, I can convert most of it to muscle. You get skinny, it's going to take three years. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, um, hi my question is, uh, could you tell me the importance of getting enzymes from living foods? Yes. When I was asked in 1980, when I came back from Europe to be the director, I said, under a few conditions, I probably would have done it anyway, but I thought, this is an opportunity. I said, one of the conditions are that we don't know how this works. We had ideas, we had theories, but if I ask four people, we had 10 ideas. So we ha my ambition was, as a guy who wasn't really a scientist who understood how to do that, but we needed to find somebody who could, is what was it in this food? It wasn't the protein, it wasn't the vitamin, it wasn't the minerals, it wasn't the essential fats. Here's what we found. The first thing you get in raw food is hormones. Now, that shouldn't surprise you because bioidentical hormones come from plants. And hormones are the language chemistry of your body. How your cells communicate with one another is through hormones. Nature's way of giving you that language is through food, green, plant-based food, raw plant-based food. That's one. Second is oxygen. When you cook a food, the fragrance coming from a food is the oxygen molecule leaving it. So breathe heavy over that. But the truth of the matter is, in 1917, a Nobel Prize was awarded when a guy said, you cannot digest a nutrient without adequate oxygen. The oxygen should be in the food. The next is phytochemicals. Now, if you don't know about phytochemicals after this, get online, because you'll be overwhelmed. You won't be able to sleep for the next several months. That's how much evidence there is. Enzymes now. Now, your body's electric. If you go to university today, and Anna Maria dragged me back to school where I got my PhD when I was 50, and I was stunned they're still teaching the misinformation at, a, at an English school. We intentionally went to an English school. They say an enzyme is a protein. That's like me saying, all you are is your skin. You should be embarrassed if I say that. You should say, wait a minute, I have an emotional state a spiritual state, I have bones, I have flesh, I have organs. You're right, I'm wrong. 
So the exterior shell of an enzyme is a protein. But what it is is electric to feed your electric body. And the only place you get it is from raw, naturally, from raw plant-based foods. Now, we have enzymes we take. For instance, I take 20 a day for anti-aging. When you first begin this, to digest the food so you don't have all that bloating and gas until your body's muscle structure learns how to digest real food, take the enzymes. And then there's other enzymes, but that's how important enzymes are. Once you, once, once you cook, boy, that's weird. Once you cook a food, the hormones are gone, the oxygen's gone, the phytochemicals and the enzymes. So for your mind, think of what I'm saying. This is a new era of hope the new era of hope. I elaborate on this in my book, Life Force. This is the future of biological nutritional medicine. Good question. Thank you. Uh, my question is, like, nowadays everyone has a cell phone, pretty much everybody, right? <laughs> you so bet. what can they do to protect themselves against the radiation, the harmful radiation, um, on a daily basis, everywhere they go? Who has a cell phone to lend me? Okay, here we go. He's probably got one of those, you know, maybe he's got diamonds on the side of it. <laughs> I'm joking. So my children hate me because I put this on speaker, and I put it on a table, and I talk out loud. The best way and safest way is not to use it. The second best way is to get away from it. It's sitting there. I'm talking. And all of you have speakers on the new cell phones. That's number one. Number two, don't think if you put a Bluetooth in there and put it in your ear, it's safe. Because the Italian showed us you get the same level of brain cancer, only it's worse because it's more focused and it goes deeper. Wow. Anna Maria today just contacted the leading authority who's done the longest research in the world in Sweden from the major university in Sweden. We're now going to interview him. So Monday we're hoping to, say, he says yes, to Skype him. We're going to interview him. We'll write about him and his research of decades in the next magazine in May. But awesome. in May also, I'm going to have Dr. Devra Davis, mm -hmm. D-E, couldn't be that, D-E-V-R-A, Devra Davis. And Devra, Devra Davis happens to be the woman who was Bill Clinton's top scientist. When he was in office, Devra Davis was literally the one who collected, did all of the science, and approved all the science. She now is a leading American authority in the world on cell phones creating cancers of the brain, et cetera. So you may want to see her. If you want to see her already, get on The Real Truth About Health, and you can see her Times Square lecture last year. She was in Times Square with us last year. So don't think that this may be not true. What I'm telling you, this causes cancer. There's no question. In Russia, they tell you that. In Sweden, they tell you that. Most legitimate company, countries around the world, Germany, they tell it, and then they try to suppress it. We talked about that. Thursday night, but this is absolutely proven at this point. And by the way, if a boy puts a cell phone in his pocket within 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 40% of his sperm count drop. I saw films done at Stanford and University of California where young girls put it in their bras now. They have a rare form of cancer exactly where the battery is. So we now see this. So good question. Um, if they're in a, like a public place where they cannot put it on speakerphone, like a library or something, Don't use um, it. and they have to put it up to their head, is there anything they can do okay. about that? On, the, on our phones, there's different legitimate devices. We use one called the GIA, but there's, that's the one I'm most familiar with because they had a lot of great science out of Russia. So that's what we chose to use. Mm -hmm. But there's other ones out there, so really do. As a matter of fact, we're now um, starting testing March the 1st with the German technology that I learned about just in the autumn. That's phenomenally effective. As a matter of fact, I made a contract with this doctor to fly in for the next building I'm going to build. I'm going to put a sheet in the cement at the bottom of the building. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Dr. Clement. A couple of questions about uh, juicing and some clarification. Yes. I'm a big time juicer. I enjoy juicing uh, twice a day. I like the benefits. I juice a variety of vegetables, including sprouts. Now, I understand the value of uh, sprouting and juicing, but would you clarify for me, when you juice living sprouts, aren't you destroying, in some respects, some of the phytonutrients? Oh, no question. Versus eating the sprouts live? Absolutely. You're going to have a slight degradation 
if you have it in a good juicer. Now, if you put it in a centrifugal juicer, you're going to kill substantial amounts. I don't know the number. It's 50, 60, 70 percent, but it's, it's high. If you put it in a juicer that is slow-turning presses that act like the teeth, that hundreds of pounds of pressure go deeply into the cell and without zapping it through air and blowing out and oxidizing it, then drink it immediately, you're probably losing 5 to 8 percent. Fifteen minutes later, it's just like blending it. So if you let it sit for 15 minutes, the hope is gone. H-O-P-E is gone. You degradate the vitamins. I mean, pretty much you have proteins and minerals left. Thirty minutes later, the proteins are shooting away. Minerals are the only thing that holds up, even in cooking, by the way. Mm -hmm. You have to really cook something for the minerals to go. They have to sort of wash out on that. Second question, besides living sprouts and wheatgrass, what other vegetables or vegetable cocktails do you enjoy? Well, I enjoy all vegetables. I mean, there's not, I don't, I don't dislike a vegetable or a fruit in the world or a grain or a seed or a nut or a bean, and I used to hate those. I mean, I used to have to force myself to eat this way because, believe me, I was a food addict like everyone, pretty much. And so I think it's not, it, the thing that really my mouth waters for now is sprouts, believe it or not. And when I used to look at them, I gagged. <laughs> I ate them because I knew they were good for me, but I go, oh, you know. It was like parsley on those fancy hamburgers we used to go to occasionally. Mm -hmm. Remember that? I used to gag. Yes. Now I like juice a pound of parsley. It's good. But, you know, if you look at certain vegetables, like cucumbers, with uh, the extraordinary mineralization they have, and it creates elasticity in the skin. And, you know, this is why you put them over your eyes when they're swollen in the morning, and it takes them away. Amazingly effective for your body. Celery. We put celery in our juice every day for people because sodium, organic sodium, not salt, Organic sodium is phenomenally effective to help the immune system because the sodium, the organic sodium, literally acts as an antiseptic for the lymphatic system as it's killing things through the immune cells that are there. So these are great things to know. If you look at, for instance, uh, bok choy, phenomenally good for cardiovascular, ventricle systems, capillaries, that type of thing. And there's great books on this. I don't write about this because others have done a better job than I would do on it, actually. But there's great, great books on this on the vegetable. But again, you have to be growing these. You have to be growing these things because if you're not growing these things, there's little to no value. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Hi. Uh, you can put it down a little bit, love. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you think children with autism? Can benefit doing this type of diet? Can they see any improvement? I don't think they can. I know they can because we've had numbers of autistic children come to us over the years. Uh, last week, I sadly had to make a comment on a research study that came out of uh, MIT in Boston, where one of their top researchers predicted something that I predicted, and it's scary to think that other people who this is their whole life agree with me. I wish I was wrong, that they predict that by the year 2025, that's 10 years from now, by the way, a little less from now, that 50% of the children born will have autism. Now, that cannot not be true. If you look at the statistics, 1980, we had one out of 10,000. Mm -hmm. Today, in most states in the United States, New Jersey's even higher, is one out of 50 to one out of 55. New Jersey's one out of 45. Believe it or not, Mississippi has the least autistic children. Why? Because it has the least population. It doesn't have a lot of factories down there. New Jersey has the most factories, pollution. When I was a kid growing up in that area, I used to smell the factories from New Jersey, and I could identify them. That's how you can, you know, oh, that's that factory. It's scary stuff. So if you take the toxins that are certainly a major part, if not the total part in some cases, out of the brain, uh, get the neurons to start to function, take away the activators like the sugars and the saturated fats, you always see some kind of a, a better effect. Now, some of these are remarkable shifts and changes, and some are minimal, but certainly the child's going to be better off and healthier. Yeah. There's a lot to go into. You may want to get on the Hippocrates website, because we did a whole night on that that's recorded. It's on the Hippocrates website. Front page, go to the right side and click in autism, and you'll hear Aunt, Dr. Anna Marie and I speak about it. We brought experts in. And we explain more about the French and how they were reversing it with sound, and it's great stuff. Hi, good evening. I just want to congratulate you on all your wonderful research, and, and I truly believe that food is medicine. I just have one question. Uh, I know that Hippocrates is very big on drinking wheatgrass, 
and in the Gerson Institute, which is also very well known for raw food and juicing, they actually don't recommend it because it's very harsh on the stomach. And I just want to understand a little bit more about that and what you what your opinion what your opinion would be on that. Thank you. Well, number one, let's uh, first uh, talk about the extraordinary work that Max Gerson did, uh, beginning 80 years ago. And he was brilliant. What he discovered 80 years ago, he was absolutely correct 80 years ago. Mm -hmm. But we've learned a lot in 80 years. We've really learned a lot in 80 years. And I get up every day and say, my God, if I can learn something better than I know, even if I've thought it for 43 years, I'm going to change. Mm -hmm. But Charlotte, who I love, she's 90 years old, best daughter, great German daughter. She does exactly what they did 80 years ago, perfectly. Isn't that wonderful? And so they still give carrot juice, even though we can show you the overwhelming science and the work we've done for over 30 years, how carrots and the fructose in them feed cancers. No question about it. They also tell you to eat raw food, and they give you, for instance, liver pills that are cooked. They tell you cooked food is perfectly fine. So there's a difference about saying raw food is good, giving the best raw food, keeping up with the phytochemicals, and telling people what the science shows today and somebody that has a theory, and congratulate them. They've helped so many people. But can you imagine how many more people we can help when we stay up to speed? Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So that looks like a night. So you know what? I always have a tradition. How many of you know my tradition? My tradition is we have to dance. <laughs> Come on, let that booty go. <laughs> <laughs>